We have to pass the one mic around, but what, if you guys just want to start with whatever is on your mind in terms of school choice and education reform, what you'd like to see, I guess we'll go in this order. Carmen, you're first. Great. Um, so I'm representing homeschool. Homeschoolers are now um, either at or above, depending on who you want to look at, um, private school student um, population. And I would say with the string break, the big thing is we are very diverse now. We used to be gene jumping, gene jumper mothers of um, six or more. <laughs> um, very strong um, Christian fundamentalists. And now we have everything from um, very liberal families, very conservative families. We have um, single mothers. Um, so we're very, uh, every ethnicity you can think of. So I think that's a huge thing is we're very diverse now, not only in who, but how we homeschool. It's everything from unschooling, which is not does not mean not schooling. Um, I won't get into all that, but that's not what it means. Um, to what I call um, home at school, which is they have desks and the posters at school and their, their house looks just like a school and everything in between. So for me, the big thing about homeschooling is it gives us the freedom, and for my family, the freedom to have space and time to pursue our children's passions and um, specialize in what their interests are. And I believe that don't do what you're good at, do what you love. And so homeschoolers have the ability to find out what they love. Um, and my, I have one that loves fashion. So last year we went to New York City. We learned how to sew. Um, she had took classes from a fashion designer. I have one that loves government and and um, finance. So he, even though he's not in high school yet, he takes high school classes in government. He takes high school classes in finance. And we went and got a bill passed, and that was much better than anything he would ever learn in a textbook or in a classroom. So I think that's the beauty of homeschooling. And the biggest thing we want to do is be left alone. Um, <laughs> and so that's what. Um, my organization um, tries to strive to is to be able to, even though I don't agree with everybody's choice of how they homeschool, is I will fight for your choice to be able to homeschool that way and um, and to be able to be just left alone to homeschool in the way we want. And if I could just ask quickly before yeah. you pass the mic, uh, it used to be that homeschooling parents had to be experts in lots and lots of different fields, right? Whereas now the on, we'll get to hear from Brian and others on, about yeah. online in a second, but the online learning tools have changed that radically, right? Oh, yes. As a homeschooling parent. Yeah, and one of the things we did in last last session, um, Skip helped with this, um, there was a little um, disagreement about how the definition of homeschooling was being defined, and they were saying that in North Carolina we had to teach every subject, um, or all the core subjects, which is, you know, <laughs> the main thing. And so we got that bill um, passed, and now we are able to use, without any, you know, online or uh, use other parents or whatever we want, we can basically have anyone teach in the way that... You have the meddlesome bureaucrats out of the way. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's hear from Brian. Good morning. Um, I would begin my remarks by saying I've had the pleasure of serving the state in the capacity of the department. I've been uh, in the local school districts and now I have the chance to, to launch a uh, North Carolina Connections Academy is a virtual charter, completely virtual, no face-to-face, -face, but we're coming in into your home, into your device, into your coffee shop, and providing supports in a really novel way, and we're up for that approval, final approval in February. So over that continuum of, say, 12 years, I've seen about every permutation of virtual or blended or distance learning. I started back in 2000 when you had sort of two cups and a string for bandwidth and a lot of dialing up uh, noise on your, your uh, modem. And I've seen just a absolute explosion of technology opportunities since. In my day job at Two Revolutions, I get to look in to about 20 different states in all kinds of configurations, whether it's nonprofit, for-profit, state houses, charter school, networks, you name it. And one of the frustrating things until the last year and a half has been that North Carolina didn't necessarily look across to those states to see what was going on. And through the uh, leadership of Governor McCrory, Lieutenant Governor Forrest, and certainly Representative Stam and others to make sure that we had a chance to really prove these models out, the last year and a half has been really rapid pace. And what we're doing at North Carolina Connections Academy is proving a concept. The first 1,500 kids will roll into our doors next fall, our virtual doors. 
and they will come from all corners of the state. Some 5,100 parents have requested this. And these students range from kids who have been, um, you know, really saddled with tough situations like Asperger's to kids that are, you know, young athletes that are traveling the world to families that can't get a quality physics teacher in the zip code they live in. So by incubating these new models, we have a real chance to do some very different things to change the odds for kids. And I think we're at the very tipping point. We are, we are in the Alta Vista stage of virtual learning. Uh, we're just starting out. And what we're learning about how kids learn and how they interact with each other and their peers online and socially is going to really transform the economy and transform this state. If you saw the announcement this week regarding Google Fiber, this is exactly its intent to create business enterprise for kids. You know, forget kids taking e-commerce classes. Let's let them create businesses in those e-commerce classes while they're in high school. These types of technologies will bring in experts around the world in real time, and you'll see them like you're in your living room. We think that North Carolina Connections Academy is the very beginning of that renaissance for the state, and really excited to share more on the panel today. For, for younger viewers, Alta Vista was a search engine from the 1990s <laughs> that is bankrupt now, by the way. I'm not sure you want to be exactly like Alta Vista, but... Um, okay, Doug. Good morning. Um, one of the things I wanted to, a few things I wanted to share with you, a few facts and a few uh, points about where we are in the charter school movement in North Carolina. Um, a lot of people get confused sometimes and forget that charter schools are public schools. I, I have people who say, well, the public schools uh, and then the charter schools and charter schools are public schools. Uh, we are funded with public dollars. Um, and we have to take state tests to be accountable just like any other public school. The big difference with a charter school though is that we are uh, governed differently. We are governed independently of school boards and government run school districts. Uh, we have uh, private nonprofit boards uh, that, that govern the schools and they're made up of volunteers uh, and, and that's something that many people have put put their house on the line to guarantee loans for charter schools on boards and work tirelessly for them. Our real accountability in a charter school is to the parents who choose to go there uh, because we have to treat them like customers. When they choose to come to a charter school, the money that was designated to the public school where they would have gone flows to the charter school. If they are not happy and they choose to leave, that money goes away. And if the charter school doesn't do a good job, it can go out of business. And so that's a novel concept that most other se sectors in our economy have to follow outside of public education, but it's working for charter schools in North Carolina. We have almost 150 charter schools now in 57 counties in the state. Uh, over a third of them have opened in the last three years since the charter school cap was removed, which is um, something that some people say is too fast of growth, but if you look at the trajectory of the history uh, Dr. Grover Bridgers is here with us. He was the first director of charter schools. In just a few years after charter schools were passed in 1996, we reached 100 charter schools and were capped out. And so the movement kind of fell asleep for almost 10 years, whereas other states were continuing to grow and mature in their charter school movement. We didn't have that opportunity. So we are having some catching up to do and having to re-educate people. Uh, the truth is that charter schools are bipartisan. Even a President or, uh, Barack Obama supports charter schools. But here in North Carolina, we only have about 5% um, of all of the public school students that are in charter schools. Well, 5% of public schools representing about 4% of all students. So there's still too many parents and students that are trapped to attend schools based on the zip code in which they live, which is not something we feel like in the 21st century should be the case. Uh, we have some of the top performing schools in the state that are charter schools uh, and, and actually in the most recent testing data I think the average charter school performance and growth uh, exceeded their district counterparts but there are also some charter schools that are not performing as well as they should and living up to their potential and so we do believe that chronically low performing schools should be closed something that doesn't normally happen in public education and something that can't happen in charter schools. Briefly, just the vision that we at the Alliance have for, for, for charter schools in North Carolina. Uh, we would like to see North Carolina become a model state for public school innovation. Uh, to us, that means not just looking at charter schools as kind of these laboratories to transfer innovation to districts. Uh, certainly that can happen. 
but um, we believe instead charter schools should be viewed as, a, as an alternative delivery system for public education that can rapidly improve quality through competition and choice, that can provide more opportunities to unleash the creative energy of all the wonderful people who work in our public school system that's pretty outdated, um, and also to provide more exp uh, opportunities to close the achievement gap for our numerous kids. Uh, nationally, uh, we're seeing the trend of scaling up excellent charter schools start to grow. Here in North Carolina, there are only three districts that have at least 10% of their students in charter schools. So the market share is low. Those districts are Rutherford County, Durham, and Lincoln County. But nationally now, 25 school districts have at least 20% of their students in charter schools, and New Orleans leads the way with 91%. So we think there's a lot of opportunity for growth. We'd like to see the charter school movement expand throughout the state to provide more opportunities and choices for more parents and students. Hi, I'm uh, Paul Stamp. I'm speaking for myself. I don't speak for 170 members of the House or Senate. But I thought it'd be easier for you to understand what I'm saying by just talking about each of the types of schools represented here and what I think should be done. One of the handouts that we've given you here is some poll information, and I'm not a Marxist who believes in the inevitability of history, but it is nice to know that the school choice uh, movement, opportunity scholarships in particular, are supported by all demographic groups only accepting those self-described as liberals but every other demographic group uh, likes it the second piece of paper we've uh, passed out describes uh, a couple of the school choice things that i'd like to talk about these one two three four five for the traditional public schools wayne county uh, working on legislation to give them uh, almost total flexibility in the allocation of resources and the ability to differentiate between schools. For the private schools, about 100,000 students represented by Mike Fiedewa here, we currently have about uh, 1,200 students in uh, receiving scholarship, low-income students receiving scholarships this year. The qualifications, eligibility, expands next year automatically, higher income level, take kindergartners, first graders, even if they haven't been to public schools, and what we need to do there is to expand from a pro, uh, basically a pilot program to a real, uh, a full-throated program where the market is, which would be about 10,000 students uh, statewide. One of the silliest arguments you'll hear is that this drains resources from the traditional public schools or costs a lot of money because not too much thought brings to mind that actually it saves money. I'll just give you one example. If we completely uh, did a full-throated uh, expansion of the program to you know, the full market, uh, it, it, it'd be about 40 million a year. Uh, that would mean about 1,000 students in Wake County. Those 1,000 students would require a building of about $50 million, and that would more than cover the cost of the entire program for the state. Uh, for charter schools, they've suffered in the last few years by reduction in local funding and have never had capital funding. You will hear arguments that uh, you know, it drains resources from the traditional public schools, which is so silly because it costs less to fund the charter schools than the traditional public schools. It's just math, you know, arithmetic which you would think they'd be good at. <laughs> so I will propose legislation that restores the original concept for local funding and also gives county commissioners an option to provide capital funding. Uh, we're in the middle of uh, pilot programs for uh, virtual schools. And then for homeschools, uh, and this also applies to private, but this the only program we have for homeschools is the special needs scholarship, which currently is six thousand a year for dis disabled parents of uh, children disabled. Uh, the, the real problems there are one that it's a reimbursement, so some people just can't afford to pay up front and then get reimbursed. So we we'll try to move some of that to a advance uh, payment for certain items. Uh, and secondly, increase the amount from 6000 a year to 8000 a year uh, to be a little more realistic on what it costs to educate a special needs child. Mike. 
Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, uh, as Linda Lynn said, this is National Catholic Schools Week, and we indeed are celebrating Catholic Schools Week here in our diocese. Uh, and uh, I'm fortunate to be joined uh, today with two of my colleagues, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't point them out. Mr. Jason Curtis is the principal of the best high school in the state of North Carolina, <laughs> High School. And then Donna Moss is the principal of the Cathedral School downtown, which is the best elementary school outside of the other 30, 24 that we have. <laughs> but I'm glad that you're, you're both here. So uh, um, I also want to thank Skip uh, Stamp for all that he's done to support so many people. Uh, and, and thanks so much, Skip. Um, in, in Catholic schools, we have a couple of core values. And first and foremost is our belief that parents are the primary educators of their children. They are the first teachers. And we embrace that knowing that when parents send their children to us, they enter into a moral partnership. And we build upon that with the partnership with the parents to make sure that when our children leave our schools, they are different people. They are better people. They are people well equipped to do what's necessary for whatever next step they decide to take. Another core value is, is that we believe that a Catholic education should be open and accessible to anybody that, that wants it. So we work very, very hard to keep costs down, to keep tuition rates low. But we also have to balance that, that issue with paying our teachers a just and competitive wage and putting our students in quality buildings. It's a challenge. The Opportunity Scholarship Act has, has allowed for, right now, over 65 families to access our Catholic schools that would not have been able to access without it. Now that doesn't seem like very much, but it's a huge beginning. And what that has done for us is that it has allowed people to finally consider a Catholic education when, they, when, when in years past, it's that were just not in the cards. I, I get very frustrated when I hear all of the reasons why opportunity scholarships are a bad thing. But let me tell you something. When you start focusing on kids as opposed to systems, when you start focusing on learning as opposed to bureaucracy, when you start focusing on what's best for, for not just Catholic school children, but all children, you start to realize we've got to do things different. Opportunity scholarships are very, very best to begin. We've got a ways to go. I've had the opportunity to serve as the chair of the uh, initial charter school advisory board and work closely with Grova. And I remember going to the state board uh, and, and we were getting hammered for, say, for, for, for the state board saying, you're not coming up with anything innovative. There's nothing here that you're, you're just kind of traditional public school light. And my only response to them, I says, you realize for the first time in many people's lives, they have an opportunity to choose a school for their kid do you realize how revolutionary that is? And that's the sort of mentality that we have to have throughout this, this, this choice movement. It's not us versus them. It's about what's best for our kids. So I'll get off the soapbox now. Um, I, a lot of people looked at me as a stay-at-home mom, uh, making that choice for our family as either being uneducated myself, <clears throat> not really knowing what I'm doing, or wanting to stay home and, as my husband says, eat bonbons all day. The reality is, is that I actually uh, completed my master's degree the month before I had my oldest son, and we made the decision that we would uh, live in a smaller home, drive cheaper cars, do whatever we needed to do to keep our children home as long as we could, to educate them the way that we felt they needed to be educated. Um, I would much rather my child learn how to behave from me as an adult than a room full of four-year-olds. Um, so making that choice early on, school choice was going to be kind of a natural transition for us. Um, keeping my children at home, I also believe that uh, younger children learn best through play. They also learn through hands-on interaction. You can do all the pediatric studies you want to do, but a child is going to learn better through touch, experience, smell. These are the things that at that young age, uh, not through doing repetitive worksheets as a five-year-old. Uh, so uh, when my oldest son was coming through, everyone would comment on how bright this child was, how brilliant this child was. He could carry on conversations with any adult in any room. If you wanted to speak about Egypt, bring it on. Well, when he began kindergarten, we realized there was a problem with his education. And we found out that he not only had dyslexia, but he suffered from auditory processing disorder. Well, you put him in a classroom with 28, 25, 28 other students, and he's immediately pegged as the dumb kid in the class. 
And it took us three years to get the teachers to understand that our child did not have a low IQ, but that he needed to learn in a different way. So I have spent the last six years re-educating my child as he comes home. Now, luckily, my husband also has dyslexia, but he's an attorney, so I think he can do pretty well with it. Um, and, and, and when there's topics that come up, I don't know how to speak to my oldest son many times because I've not suffered as he has. So I'm like, honey, please help Billy. I, I, I can't do it. I don't know how to get through to him. But my husband does, only to say that my public schools didn't mean to do a bad job with my son. They had great teachers in place. The problem that we had with our public school was the curriculum and the way they were forced to speed through things and the way they were forced to teach certain topics. And it has only gotten worse as Common Core has come into place. So of course I have been speaking out up at the legislative building in the meetings against Common Core as well. It doesn't work for everyone. And as an educated woman, I know what is best for my child and I have absolutely supported school choice from day one because I do know what's best for my children. Um, at this point, my husband will tell you I do have two strikes against me. One is I married him and two, I'm a politician. So uh, aside from that, um, I, I know, yeah, I'm <laughs> at this point, but, and I will be the rub on my board and I'm good with that because I believe that every student needs to be able to go to a school where they can thrive to learn the way that they learn, but at the same time, we've got to turn our public school teachers loose to be able to teach to the child. And I think that will help in the public schools, but I do have to say this as well. I find it comical that all the push we've had for all these years against charter schools and against vouchers and against homeschooling. Now that they can't fight them anymore, they're coming. They're saying, well, we want you to share your information. You need to tell us what's working for you. It's very disingenuous to me. You know, oh, we don't want you here. You're not capable. But by the way, whatever works for you, please tell us. So anyway, as I said, uh, absolutely ecstatic to be here on this panel. and. Uh, I think we can get some things going in the state of North Carolina. I'm excited. So just to stay right there for a second, I'm curious. So if you're a Common Core critic, if you had difficulty in some of the <coughs> public schools, if you go, try to get the school board to change their philosophies, mm -hmm. have you thought about Catholic schools? Have you thought about charter schools? Yes, have you thought actually, about online learning? What, like, why? I, actually, yes. My husband will tell you the only reason I'm not allowed to homeschool is because I can't stay focused enough. We play entirely too much in my house. But truly, that play is the learning. Uh, right. And... Um, the reason what about that I, the others? Well, with, we tried private school with my son, the school that we tried to put him in, they did not have a tutor for his needs at that moment. So I've been having to do private tutoring. So the, the, the cost benefit. We would have put him in our new charter school in Wayne County, but he's one year too old. So we're waiting for it to catch up at this point. So we are actually now applying for um, the Wayne School of Engineering, but there's 200 plus applicants for that school and only the first 66 get in, and I can't doodle my name on the top of the paper and say my son needs to be the first 66, unfortunately. So we are still continuing to pursue these options, and we actually had made up our mind. Um, as Christians, we prayed about it, and I told my husband, if I lose the selection, we will homeschool. We will at least homeschool the oldest. Oh, okay. And if I win the election, then I'm gonna do everything I can to help everyone have the opportunity to make those choices that they need to make. Okay. So I well, feel like that's where I'm supposed to be. Okay, so let's let's go to, back to charter schools for a second. And so the um, question I was going to have is about charter school authorizing the state. 100, 153, you said? A little less than 150. We started the year with 148, I think. A couple right. Of so, right. So like you said, for a decade, I used to go around the country and talk about North Carolina because I found that story so amazing that someone said well there's a hundred counties in the state let's just set the cap at about a hundred that's one per county that sounds like the right number so then some counties got a whole bunch then other counties couldn't have any charter schools because the cap is already filled and anyway but still uh, for an entire state 100, 150 or so is not a huge number i understand you could have other authorizers like nc state or unc but those universities have said don't, we don't want anything to do with this, right? We don't want to authorize any charter schools, so go away. So I guess what, what do you see as the impediment to more charters being authorized in North Carolina? Well, um, that's I, what a mother like this wants. Am 
mindset change for number one. I think we do have, um, unlike states that have more growing, really vibrant charter school movements, uh, we require everything to go through one authorizer, which is um, meaning that there is a, a, an advisory commission that is appointed by the State Board of Education. And more or less the state here approves every school, whereas in a lot of states, the state board might approve various authorizers. So you might have public universities that have to say, well, we at UNC Wilmington really want to do a good job and authorize charter schools and, and take a percentage, maybe 1%, some states do, to, to fund their office to do that under the direction or the policy set by the state board. They may have mayors that could do that. They may have local school districts that can do that. Uh, which really allows you to scale, uh, scale up that faster. We've, we've had some problems with really getting uh, an application process that's fair, that's rigorous, but also allows good schools to be approved, uh, to replicate quality schools, something that other states have figured out that we still haven't figured out, and the renewal process here is still too complicated for schools. So I think we need to get to that point. I think we do need to be careful, though, as we talk about multiple authorizers. The school districts now are asking for their own charter schools. And um, in states that have local districts that can authorize charter schools, it's, it's a, the authorizer does not operate the school. And so what they're really asking, I'm afraid, it's all in the details, is we want charter schools that are really like magnet schools that we can control and, and keep the money from going away from our school district so that we can still have the power and the money. And so um, we just have to be careful about how we do that. But, but Why it, haven't the universities in North Carolina taken this? Uh, usually people like power, big institutions like universities. Well, and, and, and uh, Mike, you may be able to address that since you were on the board when uh, the, the Charter Advisory Board when that was the case. But I understand even though that was a possibility for them to go through, they still had to go through to the state board. And, and they're, the, politically speaking, the, the universities were advised, okay. you don't want to do this. Let's hear from that. Yeah, yeah there, there is a there is a real and I think the situation is so tight that um, you know and in, in and in the very beginning working when we when we started this it just became simpler for folks to go right to the state board rather than have to go to the local LEA and then go to somebody else when when inevitably all of that goes to the state board anyway so they just jumped over all of that um, I, I don't again I have been out of the charter school world for a little bit but then I don't know if that's changed but um, okay. so, certainly. Let me ask you about more about private schools then and the new voucher law. Right. The, the North Carolina Supreme Court is about to hear this uh, uh, case, but so far there are, I think it's a cap, the program at $10 million. Is that right? Is that right? Skip that's, that's currently right now. Oh, like 11 million, but only about half that's being used. Right. Only okay. about half that's being used because of all the back and forth and the legal contracts. So for an entire state, $10, $11 million is not a lot of money when distributed over that many. And you have way more applicants for these vouchers than you have we, money uh, if, for if, if the uh, uh, original injunction had not occurred, we would have had um, a tremendous number, more than 65 families accessing this. Right. But, um, well, so Skip, what is the, what would it take to get in every year, and it needs to be about 40 million a year, would get it to about where the market is based on experience in other states that have had a long-standing programs and then a lot of times though once once the mark that's where the market is now when there's no one is talking about it and very few families are telling their neighbors that my kid is having this now right so and it tends to become more popular once it has a foothold yes and the experience for example in florida is that while these are very controversial when they're begun then once it's in place and is uh, increased, it becomes almost unanimous in the support. All right. Any doubts about what the North Carolina Supreme Court might do, or are we confident they will rule in favor of others? I, I, I don't know what they'll do. I have read the briefs, all the briefs of the opposition, and they're so silly in their arguments that I expect the op opponents to lose. <laughs> okay. I mean, they're so contrary to okay. normal rules of Logic, logic, reason, logic, reason. things like that. All right. So, so Brian, let's talk about the uh, the Connections Academy online charter school. This could be open to any student in the state, right? This this is going to happen, or do you need some sort of approval still? Where, where is this in the <coughs> fait accompli uh, analysis? We are slated for a February approval decision. So oh. we've passed all of the 
preliminary approvals and also the state board had an open meeting uh, last month we've been meeting diligently with a host of attorneys and a host of uh, personnel from the staff of the Department of Public Instruction, the State Board, and Who's finalizing the charter group. Who's going to decide next month? The State Board. The State Board. You, you want to handicap that for us? <laughs> you know, it's difficult to predict uh, the tactics of the State Board, but I would say uh, they're going to be in a very difficult position if they don't approve two pilots that were approved by the legislature. So. That puts them in a very unique position that they haven't been in. This would be very new ground. So I have, I have a handicapped perspective of about 75% assurance that we're going to make it through. That 25% that I would hold back is that we would be delayed again. And what's interesting is they talk about wanting quality, but they're not modeling national best practice for opening a school. We're down to a six-month window. Now, we're fortunate in working with Connections as a charter management organization and an educational management organization that we have uh, the resources, the staff, the infrastructure to make all that happen, sure. and the experience. Yeah. Not every charter does. As Doug mentioned, many charters have to go out and mortgage a house, or they have to you know, find resources in the very last stages of their effort. So we feel very confident it's going to happen. People might say to you, I'm sorry to interrupt. People might say to you, though, uh, this is only for rich kids who have great broadband internet and the, the latest in uh, MacBooks at home. And so what about families that don't have that? You're, you're counting them out. You're a mean person, and why are you ignoring them? Well, you know, right now there's no requirement that face-to-face -face kids be equipped with a one device, one-to-one -one device. There's no requirement that face-to-face -face kids have connectivity in their homes. According to the president's plan, this is absolutely a prerequisite, right? Like, every kid needs a device, every kid needs connectivity. So what you do is you look at the dollars you have, and we've already been cut from regular charters down $1,000 per kid. And now in the last two weeks, there's been three arbitrary and capricious financial requirements that have surfaced. So we would be cut another 500 in what we can offer. So the trick is, once you see those applicants come in in our enrollment period, which is from March to April, you start to say, okay, how many of those kids need devices and connectivity, and how can we work with the budget to make that happen? There's many institutes, like here in, here in the Triangle, Cramden Institute, which many of you know, who offers free devices and computers. That's one of the first places we would go. Also, this is about partnering with local districts, and to Doug's earlier point, you know, we want to work with the public school districts on wet labs and a host of things that we need them for. And just a quick question on that. Some states like Florida have course choice, where in any student in the state can opt out of a particular course and just take that one course online. Mm -hmm. If you don't like your geometry teacher, you can take that course online and everything else in the regular district school or charter school. It's free to every kid, homeschool, charter school, private school, public school, all through, all through Florida. Have you thought about course choice as part of your offerings? We have, but the requirements that the State Board laid out in terms of our virtual charter being a full school versus a supplemental program like the state's North Carolina Virtual Public School, there's a difference there. What we will be moving to is not just a lift in the charter cap, but when you look five and ten years out, we're going to be moving to assembled diplomas where credentials will come from all of our shops. And so what begins to happen is if you look in the industry right now with micro-credentialing for certifications, places like the University of Wisconsin that offer you a full residential experience, a partial online, and just a $10,000 diploma, that's coming to publics and charters, and we'll have more decisions to make around choice not only to the, the course level, but choice to the certification level as well. So Carmen, you said you guys mostly just want to be left alone. I'm inclined not to ask you any other questions. <laughs> um, so with that said, this uh, online could be a, 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 a sort of a sea change for the homeschooling community, right? If there's a, a statewide online school with full curricula and, and a way to ch have chat rooms and emails with teachers who know subject matter, and uh, you guys talk about it. Could there be a big deal for homeschoolers in the state? Um, I think for some there would be. You, like I said, we're very diverse, so I'm thinking some families would think that's awesome. Some families, like, um, are fairy, want to do things their own way. So they would think even something like that would be putting them too much into a box and not enough flexibility. Um, we already have great online opportunities for certain subjects or for the whole school, for that matter. Um, the benefit of that would be the cost because um, some of those online classes can get very expensive for us. Um, right. If you want a teacher on the other end who can help yeah. the student, right? Yeah, it gets very costly as far as, you know, 
tuition and stuff. And you know, a lot of homeschool families are one income families. Yeah. So. Um, you guys talking about Common Core a lot? Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I, I think, you know, people think it doesn't touch it, touch us, it does touch us. Um, you know, um, there's whole homeschool um, Facebook pages about, these are all the homeschool curriculum that is common core, so stay away from it. Um, which I think is not necessarily true. I don't think just because it's aligned with common core is necessarily bad, but. Um, it could be the SAT starts to align exactly. its test Exactly, there's more. lots of concerns about, you know, what that could affect us. Um, and, and even though we homeschool, we do, I mean, the, you know, it's shocking, but we do care about education and other people's education. Um, <laughs> you know, some people think, well, you have no business talking about public schools or you have business, but um, yeah. we do you care. You just pay for it. Yeah, exactly. We pay <laughs> for it. What business do you and, have to talk about? <laughs> and we are going to have to deal with those students later on. Um, <laughs> so um, we do care, and we do want everybody to have a, um, uh, you know, a good education. So I think we do have a say in um, that. I would like to speak really quickly, oh. though, uh, to something that I went through this week. It, <laughs> I bet you're going to buy Common Core, aren't you? No, no, oh, actually, okay. I'm going back to the virtual schools. Yes. Okay, all right. Uh, I actually had the opportunity to attend a North Carolina School Board Association meeting this past week in Pinehurst, and one day was enough for me of the two day conference. <laughs> And one of the topics, I'm sorry, did that come out? Okay. <laughs> one of the topics was virtual charter schools. And to sit through a presentation that was so completely against you guys, it was painful. What did they say? What they, uh, of course, I believe the legislator said that we had to have at least two uh, schools for the charter, the pilot program. We only had two companies to apply. And then the next 30 minutes was absolutely everything that was wrong with k-12 and a little bit that they didn't like about you guys right. they, they couldn't pull too much the two largest <laughs> companies in, in the country in the country. academy and k-12 are the providers of online curricula so right. uh, they're the two kind of big players exactly and the they are, Pepsi of online learning. that's right and they're the only two that have applied in north carolina and so the uh north carolina school board is hoping that they won't be forced to uh take both they're only wanting to take one into the pilot program this is you know it wasn't a private closed session, so I can say this. Um, so just so you know, they're only looking to um, hopefully get you guys in. But after this you know, 35, 45 minute presentation of all these schools are failing that are doing online virtual, all these schools are being closed down, the eight conservatives in the room became very apparent pretty quickly. And someone asked, well, can you tell us what's good about virtual schools? And your school board association goes, no. And, and so that's the, the, that's what we're fighting. And so as a school board member, and I have to, and I'm a part of this group, I, I'm having to fight that daily to try to push them to open up, be more open-minded, understand they are not reaching all the needs of all the people. It's not a personal assault on you as a public school. It is a, a searching for what is right for my child. And so of course, I'm not gonna be quiet. And I say, okay, well, I see these statistics, and we all know that all homeschoolers are not homeschooling because of religious reasons. Some are choosing to homeschool because of uh, the schools are failing in their districts. Some choose to homeschool because of learning disabilities. Can you please explain to me of all these virtual schools that have failed, how many of these students would have been failing in public school as well? They don't have the numbers. And, then you and, and they don't want like, to give you the numbers. What about a kid in a rural area who wants AP physics and has no teacher for that? That's what about it. a kid who's in a hospital for a year because they're sick and they need online, online learning could open up their minds? That's it. They don't answer that. And they're right? very concerned about the funds. They keep saying, well, all these homeschoolers, we're expecting 25% of the people that will be in the virtual school will be homeschoolers. Well, the state's going to kick in some money because the student is in, in school, but they're concerned about all the money it's going to drain out of the counties. They're just looking at it long. All right, we're giving a rap signal, but I see Brian as a finger. If you could just uh, limit uh, something shorter than the proclamation. <laughs> yeah, I'll just take 30 seconds. I think one of the things that is important as you begin to educate your constituencies and look at these studies, Stanford has done massive studies in charters in general. And when they look across the space, the subsection that is virtual charters, when you begin to look at states like Wisconsin, South Carolina, Georgia, who all run Connections Academy programming 
those states have met AYP for multiple years, in some cases six out of eight. They've exceeded and met state averages in ELA, math, science, et cetera. One of the real interesting things about our application is I'm the first applicant in the history of Connections Academy to have a one-year contract. That's significant in that that holds accountability to the model and to the process. If we don't like the way that's rolling out, we've also consulted with the Charter School Growth Fund and we have opportunities the following summer. So when you cite these statistics about failing virtual schools, you can look across public schools and find very dire examples of huge swatches of students who are failing in multiple cities. So the good, the bad, and the ugly exist in all of the sectors, private, charter, public, and we want to copy and emulate the best. All right. All right. Thank you. Let's hear it from our panel. And Bob, thank you so much.